Before we consider how to measure rates of reaction in chemistry, it's worth reminding ourselves what we mean by rate of reaction. In order to calculate it, I need to first of all measure the change in concentration of my reactants or products and divide that by the change in time over which that process has happened. So the ideal units for rates of reaction would be moles per decimeter cubed per second. And I could write that on one line like this. Unfortunately, measuring rate of reaction directly is very difficult. However, we can measure it indirectly by monitoring changes in things like mass or volume or colour. So let's look at three simple approaches to indirectly measuring rate of reaction. The first example will be considering how we measure the change in mass during a chemical reaction. And it's important to note that when changing mass in a chemical reaction, we must be looking at a chemical reaction that is producing a gas which can leave the reaction vessel. For example, you might see a setup something like this. In this diagram, you can see a conical flask placed on a balance. And we might be investigating a reaction, for example, between an acid and a carbonate. In a reaction between an acid and a carbonate, the most important feature is that a gas, in this case carbon dioxide, is being produced. In order to prevent any acid solution from bubbling out of the vessel as well, you might notice there's a small piece of cotton wool in the neck of the conical flask. So how can we measure the rate of reaction indirectly using this method? Well, let's consider a graph that's recording the mass of my reaction vessel over time. As, con as carbon dioxide continues to be produced by this reaction, we would expect to see the mass dropping something like this. And I'll know the reaction has finished when the mass stops decreasing. If I were to draw a line of best fit on my graph, it's going to look like this. And you might notice that the shape of that graph is not a straight line, it's actually a curve. And the reason we see it dropping most steeply at the beginning is because at the beginning of my reaction, I have the highest concentration of my reactants, in this case the acid solution and carbonate powder, therefore we're more likely to have collisions between them at that stage. As my reactants are used up and their concentration decreases, they will bump into each other less frequently, so my rate of reaction will slow down until the end of the reaction when my graph becomes a plateau. When calculating the rate of reaction in this example, I would expect to see units of grams per second. Let's now look at a second example. In this example, we're going to be measuring rate by recording the change in volume of a gas produced. And again, this will require a chemical reaction that produces a gas. You might see a setup something like this. In this case, I've taken a conical flask containing my reactants and I've used a stopper and a delivery tube connected to a gas syringe. And in this case, let's stick with the same reactants. I've got an acid solution and some carbonate powder. What we will need to do, we will measure the volume of gas produced over a period of time. So again, if we plot that on a graph, it might look something like this. As with the previous example, we'll know when this reaction is finished because the volume of gas stops changing. Now let's add a line of best fit. And again, you'll see that instead of a straight line, we are most often going to see a curve. At the beginning of my reaction, we see the steepest part of the line where the rate of reaction is fastest because we have the highest concentration of reactants able to bump into each other. As the reactants get used up, it's less likely they're going to bump into each other, so my rate begins to slow down. 
and at the point where my graph has plateaued, I know that reaction has finished. When calculating the rate of reaction in this experiment, we'd expect to see units of centimetres cubed per second. Let's now look at a third example, which would be measuring colour changes. In this case, my reaction must either produce a precipitate, or I may use an indicator that changes colour at a certain point in the reaction. Let's consider an example where my reaction produces a precipitate or solid particles which make my solution go cloudy. In this example we're doing a chemical reaction in a boiling tube and we're looking down from above to see how long it takes for the black cross written on the paper underneath the tube to disappear. This is known as the disappearing cross method. In this example Instead of taking a number of measurements over a time, we are simply waiting for that cross to disappear from our eyesight. You'll notice that because this reaction has produced tiny bits of solid in the solution, I can no longer see the cross. And at that point, I stop the time and then might repeat this experiment with slightly different conditions. Because I am not taking multiple measurements, we can't draw a graph with this method to represent just one reaction. We simply repeat this experiment, changing a factor like temperature each time, and then I compare the individual values for each of those reactions. The units of rate we would use then are representing how long it takes for one colour change divided by a certain amount of time. So the units would simply be 1 divided by time, or 1 over seconds. Let's now consider the key points from this video. Firstly, because rate cannot be calculated or measured directly, we have to measure it indirectly using one of three methods. Firstly, we could measure the change in mass over time. Second, we can measure the change in volume of gas produced over time. And third, we can measure the time taken for a colour change to occur. And by plotting graphs of our data, we can represent rate of reaction in a variety of different units. Hopefully, this video was of some help.